presenting uh, work on authenticating dynamic dictionaries. Leo. Thank you, Agilus. Uh, we, uh, short chords. Let's see if we can fix that. Better. Great. Um, Hi everyone, uh, I'm Leo Raisin. I'm very excited to tell you about this work. Uh, it is uh, hot off the press in the sense that the code was just released uh, yesterday. Um, so, so you are uh, seeing it for the first time. The paper's been on ePrints for a little bit, but the code is just out. Um, so this is joint work with Dmitry Mishkov, Alexander Chepornoy, and Sasha Ivanov. And I'm gonna talk about authenticated dynamic dictionaries. I'll explain what they are and how we apply them to cryptocurrencies. I won't explain what those are. Okay, so here's our motivation. You've got Alice who wants to pay 14 bitcoins to David, uh, and she writes a transaction about that, and um, you want to validate the transaction, right? Um, and so part of the validation is stateless. You look at the transaction and you say, okay, there's like the transaction syntax, the fields have been filled in, right? And, and they all match, and there's a digital signature of Alice's public key, um, and that all you can validate just by looking at the transaction. But then the big piece that's hard to validate is actually making sure that Alice actually has those 14 bitcoins or more to give away. And that part is stateful, and that part you have to know how much Alice has based on prior transactions, right? So maybe you know that public of Alice actually has 36 bitcoins, and that's good enough. But then, of course, you're not just trying to process transactions for Alice. If you're really trying to validate transactions, you're going to have to have this key value store of uh, public keys mapped to the current amounts that they have, and you're going to have to look things up in that key value store in order to validate transactions, right? Um, and the problem with this key value store, this dictionary data structure, is that it's big, uh, and it's growing. So maybe today it's not huge, but it's going to grow if, we, if this thing is going to scale. Um, today it's about uh, one and a half gigs in Bitcoin if you serialize it. Um, and, um, you know, things get worse if you have a blockchain for many assets because then you have to have one key value store for every asset that you're uh, dealing with, um, and this becomes a problem. So that's the problem we're going to try to address. Um, so the question is, right, so you have this state, where do you keep it? You have this key value store, where do you keep it? And there's kind of two answers. You keep it on disk, um, and then you have slow validation, and that has actually been used uh, for denial of service attack, forcing you to do disk seeks. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, a weak laptop isn't going to be able to do this. And the other answer is that you keep it in RAM um, because you've bought a lot of RAM, in which case you're kind of limiting, you know, uh, the, the ability of weak devices uh, to validate it, and you get sort of more central centralization of a cryptocurrency, which sort of uh, defeats the democratizing purpose of cryptocurrencies, at least to some envision it. So we'd like to be able to uh, enable validation on weak devices, right? Um, so the observation uh, that has been made um, sort of before us um, is that you really don't need to store this huge data structure, right? As a verifier or a transaction by Alice, you kind of are only interested at the moment in how much money Alice has. And the rest of the stuff, yeah, it's there, but at the moment you're not interested in it. Um, so you want a proof of this one single fact, how much Alice has, and, and there's this idea that's been kind of floating in various early versions and was uh, crystallized a bit more precisely by Bill White is that why don't we actually use authenticated data structures and Alice will prove as part of the transaction that she has the right amount of money or somebody will prove that Alice has the right amount of money. Right? So we will authenticate this key value store and show that the value associated with PKA is 36 and therefore you can subtract 14 from it and still remain positive. Right? So I'll go into a little bit more detail. Um, into how we're going to do this. So um, imagine that we just put uh, alphabetically all the public keys uh, at the bottom of, of a tree, and we hash things pairwise and hash things up and hash things up. That's called the Merkle tree, in case you haven't seen this before. And the very root hash of that thing is the Merkle root. Um, and uh, we are going to imagine this is a block header, right? And we're going to put that Merkle root into the block header. OK? And then, you know, if. Um, and, and for now, assume that this Merkle root at least can be trusted. I will explain later why it can be trusted. Okay, so just live with that assumption for a moment. Assume it's a, it's a true indication of who has how much money, the root hash of the data structure. Okay. Um, and then, 
Right, if I want to prove uh, at the moment that I'm verifying the transaction that, that Alice actually is sending 14 uh, bitcoins to David, that Alice really has that money, I'm going to send uh, an authenticating path. It's the stuff highlighted in how it was supposed to be read, but I don't know what you see uh, down there. Is it kind of red-ish? Okay. Um, so, um, right, we're going to send the Merkle path, which are the hashes of siblings on the path from the leaf to, to the root of this Merkle tree. And then anybody validating the transaction will be able to see that, uh, you know, that that is indeed a leaf in this Merkle tree. And it's fairly standard Merkle stuff. There's nothing new I've said yet if you've seen uh, Merkle trees before. Uh, but the point is that a light verifier can ch check the entire block of transactions without storing this huge key value store by just verifying these Merkle paths. And, and sort of you get a light verifier with full verify security guarantees. Right, so each transaction will include the Merkle path that proves that Alice has the correct amount. So if you think from the various verifier's point of view, the verifier gets the block header. Again, I'm assuming that this root hash can be trusted. We'll figure out why in a, in a little bit. Um, and then the verifier will, you know, take the root hash, take the transactions and the proofs for each one, do the Merkle verification and output yes or no. And this is sort of important because we're trying to prevent denial of service attacks. Because Merkle paths are short, they're logarithmic in the size of the key value store, right? Uh, the verifier should be able to do this quickly, and so the denial of service attack, that's sort of an important goal, right? Go back to the prover for a moment. What happens to the prover, right? The prover, is, uh, the prover in this case is the miner, the one who's putting transactions into uh, the, the block. Um, a transaction is going to modify values, um, right? So uh, if Alice sends 14 bitcoins to David, Alice's uh, 36 will become 22. Is it too late in the afternoon to do this math? Um, and then the hash values up above will, will, will change all the way to the root. And then, of course, David will get this money, and the hash values up from David will, will change. Um, and so, right, a bunch of more transactions will come in, and a bunch of stuff will change, and so there will be a new root hash. And this is where I included in the next block. Right? The miner who puts the transactions to the current block will also have to put the new root hash in, into it, um, the, into the next block, I mean. Um, and so this is uh, where things get interesting, where something new has to come in. The verifier actually needs to check that this new root hash is correct. That is essential to verifying the chain. The next block's root hash has to match what would happen to the root hash when the transactions take place. Otherwise, you don't actually know that the account's data structure is correct. Maybe the miner gave herself a ton of money in the process and now has a root hash that says, I have a ton of money. Right? That, that, that's not good. Um, so in addition to doing the verification that, that we talked about, the verifier also needs to compute the new root hash and match it up and make sure it's correct. And it is really this process that enables us to go from one block to the next. This is different from the Merkle trees you've probably seen because what we need is we need to support not only authentication but also update of the root hash by the verifier, who does not know the data structure. The verifier doesn't have the Merkle tree. Of course, the miner has the Merkle tree can update the root hash, because that's standard binary tree stuff. It's the verifier who doesn't have the whole thing, but still needs to be able to recompute the root hash. And the things that we need to support are, OK, the easy one is update the value of a key. That's essentially the same as authenticating the key, because the authenticating path will be enough to update. Um, you know, subtract, 20, subtract 14, add 14, that sort of thing. Uh, the more interesting thing is that you will also be inserting new keys because new accounts will come online, and you will also be deleting keys when you get a zero account. Let's say you want to get rid of, maybe you don't, maybe you do, depends on your application, right? But you may want to get rid of zero balance accounts, for example. And in binary trees, these operations are interesting uh, because insertions and deletions, if you want a good binary tree that doesn't get unbalanced, right, require you to rebalance a tree which means you have to look at a bunch of nodes and move them around, and that requires thinking about how are you going, as a verifier, without seeing those nodes, how are you going to compute the new root hash? So that's where things get interesting. Okay. Um, but now, of course, if we manage to do that sort of thing, then we can go all the way back to the genesis block, verify from the beginning, and that's how we really know that this root hash can be trusted. Right? We go back from the beginning and we do this one, one step at a time. So what we want to be able to trust this account's data structure that is now authenticated and whose root hash is in the block is to be able to compute the next root hash when changes take place. We know what the changes are. They are the transactions that are included. They're serialized. We know exactly what they are. But we need to be able to perform them without having the entire Merkle tree. We need to be able to compute the new root hash without having the Merkle tree that stores the key values. 
Okay? Um, and just to emphasize that this is not a typical thing, you've seen authenticated data structures before. You've probably seen dynamic authenticated structures where we change things all the time um, in like certificate transparency and we record the history of changes. In those systems, the verifier is typically not checking the new root. The new root is given by, by, by someone else. Here, the verifier is actually computing the new root. So this model is called the two-party model. We only have provers and verifiers in our model, as opposed to the more traditional model you've probably seen, which is the three-party model. The three-party model, because there's a third party who gives you the new root. We don't have that. We have the only provers and verifiers. Nobody is trusted. That doesn't mean we're the first ones to do this. There is prior work in this model. And actually, now I want to go over what's been done. Um, kind of all relevant prior work that's relevant to our story here is based on Merkle trees, some variants thereof. Um, the, difference are, are, the differences are only in how you structure and rebalance the underlying tree. Because binary trees, if you remember your data structures 101, come with different balancing algorithms. And that's where things get different for them. And of course, the better you balance the binary tree, the closer your leaves are to the root, and the closer your leaves are to the root, the shorter your proofs are. And that's the only thing that matters for us, is the length, therefore, the proof length. So we're going to look at prior work in terms of proof length. Um, the first uh, data structure that, that was explicitly working in the two-party model is by Papamantha and Tamasia from 2007, and it's a skip list. A skip list is essentially a variant of binary tree, the way it was implemented there. So I'm not going to go into what it is. Let's look at its performance, and there are two things we worry about here. There's the updating an existing value, which is essentially just a proof of a lookup, and inserting a new value. Um, and those proof lengths is what we want to look at. They're both 1.5 times h times log n. Probably a good idea to define what h and n are. Um, n is the number of things in your key value store, the number of leaves, the number of public keys. Okay, so that's the number of, 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 of people in your system. And h to the length of a hash, because we're giving hash values after all. The best you can hope for is h log n, simply because binary trees are like that. This is 50% worse, so it's not, it's not bad, right? It's only 50% worse than what you could hope for in the best best case scenario. The problem with this approach for our purposes is that it requires trusted randomness. If skip lists are inherently randomized, if randomness is bad, then you get an unbalanced tree, and if you get an unbalanced tree, uh, then uh, you get very long proofs, which defeats the purpose because the verifier can get an analysis service attack. You can get linear length proofs as opposed to logarithmic. That's bad. And we don't have a source of trusted randomness unless we come up with something clever because it's the provers who could be interested in making the verifiers be slow. And the provers are the ones putting the transactions in. So that's kind of the problem with, with this approach for us. There is an approach by Miller, Hacks, uh, Miller, Hicks, Katz, and Xi from 2014, which works for generic data structures, beautiful paper that can turn any data structure into a two-party authenticated one. The specific thing they implement is red-black trees with a plus at the end. Plus means all the things have been pushed to the leaves. All the relevant stuff is at the leaves. Um, and they achieve h plus k log n. Now what is k? k is the length of, of the public key, the thing that's at the bottom. So in our setting, um, it's roughly about the same as the length of a hash. It's 256 at least for 128-bit for security. And so you essentially have doubled uh, the optimal, right? So slightly worse um, than skip lists in terms of length. Um, the reason that is the case is because it's generic. It works for any data structure. Uh, but what is considerably worse is the insertion of new things. And it's, it, it makes, uh, it's worse by a factor of three. Um, and that's because of the red black tree algorithms. They, they happen to require a lot more nodes, so the verifier to perform the insertion needs to know all these nodes, and therefore the proofs get long. Okay. Um, and there's a ton of work on three-party solutions going back to our NISIM that I'm not going to go over because, well, they don't work for us. They, they don't allow the verifier to compute the new root. So where do we come in? Um, we tried very hard to find the correct binary search trees that will work well for this problem. Um, and we settled on AVL plus trees. What are AVL trees? They've been designed, they were the first binary trees that are balanced by Adelson, Velsky, and Landis from 1960s. And uh, you cover them in your data structures 101, perhaps. The nice thing is that for both of these operations, they give us exactly H log N. They are optimal. They're as well, they're as good as you can do. They don't require trusted randomness. Uh, they don't have this factor of two and factor of three. Um, they're basically, the proofs are what they are. Uh, the source of improvements, uh, given the time, I won't exactly tell you what they are. IBL trees are cool. Uh, look in the paper. Um, but I want to show you a little bit of implementation results. What do you get with AVL trees? Okay. Um, this is the proofs. Uh, the upper line on this axis is the proof length 
for the Ethereum tri. The lower line is our proof length. On the y-axis is the tree size on log scale, from about 1,000 to about a million. And you can see that we're three times more efficient than Ethereum proofs in terms of length, and Ethereum does not give you the ability to compute the new root while we do. Okay, so that's one data point. We didn't just compare with Ethereum, we implemented a bunch of other data structures that one could hope for, trips and skip lists and other things, and you can see that our line is, our line is the bottom one. It, it performs better than all the others. The upshot is if you've got about a million keys in your system, your proof size is about 765 bytes at high security value, 128-bit security. Uh, deletion proofs are about 50 bytes longer. Deletions are a bit harder, but not much longer. Uh, and this result also improves many three-party papers. If you know the Crosby Wallach paper that does a bunch of three-party authenticated data structures, this, uh, this improves it by, by a considerable amount. Okay. We have one more improvement, and that's probably all the time I'll have to tell you. Um, imagine that we have a bunch of transactions in a block, right? They are going to have to share proofs because you're going up the tree, you're sharing some hashes. We can actually improve the result by... Uh, uh, by, by, say, by combining these proofs together. So, for example, right, what is the proof for the value of Alice? It's the red stuff. Notice that there's one hash value at each level of the tree, right? Um, and, and two of the leaves. What is the proof for, the, for Bob? It's the blue stuff. Again, one hash value at each of the trees. But we don't need to send both the red and the blue. The purple, is it kind of coming out purple? Uh, the purple, right, the purple hash we save uh, because we only send it once. It's good for both. At the next level, we save again because we save nothing instead of two values. Because both the red, what was, what was red and what was blue, can now be computed from the leaves. So you save in two ways by combining these proofs. Some things you just don't need to send and some things you only send once. Um, and as a result of this compression, so what is this graph showing? The black line is no compression, it's a straight line. The red line, if you just try to apply GZIP, which should be good at getting repeated values out because that's sort of what it's designed for. The blue, uh, that's the red line. The blue line is ours. What's on the x-axis is the log of the batch size. How many things are you putting together? On the y-axis is the proof length per operation, of course. So once you start putting a bunch of things together, let's say you put 2,000 operations together, which is what you need for 1,000 transactions because it's 2,000 things that change, right? Plus 1,000 minuses, 1,000 pluses, 2,000 operations. If that's your batch out of a million keys, you save about a factor of two in the, in the proof length per operation. So you get about 370, proof, uh, 370 byte proofs per operation on your dynamic authenticated data structure. You've got 2,000 operations together, and it's a very nice uh, curve going down on, on log scale, going down linearly. So I think I'm out of time. To conclude, you can actually go down from, uh, you know, expensive machines down to cheap machines. If you allow yourself to use authenticated data structures, we have a, in the paper there's more detail, of course, a simulation. The black line is the time per block that you took to process a block. The x-axis is, is the number of blocks in your chain. The black line is what happens when you have to go to the external key value storage, to the hard drive or the solid state drive to get your key value associations. And the red line, um, is, is what happens when you do hashes instead of verifying Merkle trees, verifying our proofs. Um, the paper is on ePrint. There's code. It's public domain. CC0 license. Do with it whatever you want. Um, and uh, it will be incorporated uh, into the Waves platform, which is an actual cryptocurrency, multi-token cryptocurrency. Thank you. All right, so um, I don't see any questions, so let's uh, thank Leo again. So, and this brings us to the end of this session and the end of RWC 2017. So Tom Ristenpart is going to uh, do the final word. That's a big hand for Tom, like who actually uh, did so much work uh, with local arrangements. All right, sorry, just uh, like two, two minutes of uh, announcements, uh, if it actually stays up there. Oh, no, it doesn't.